Merry Christmas, Sun Hills. Hey, we're setting up a few more chairs here. Uh, we got more people coming in from the lobby, so we just want to make sure we have enough seats for everybody as we kind of get this thing started. We intended to have some time together this evening to be out there and drinking some hot and eating snacks together just to start our time with fellowship and engagement and community because that's what's so important to us as a church. We're able to engage uh, at all these times. So, so uh, thank you and, and being early with us in that way and being able to engage. You'll notice um, your seats is ornament here. I'm having some trouble and I'm not sure why. Let me try this, or do you want me to do that? unplug? I'm gonna try this some more. Let's see if this works. That's too bad. This is gonna be fun. Maybe we can do like the old video. Okay, let's try it here like this. You have on your a couple of these right here. Um, and uh, and these, are, these are really cool. These are ornaments from um, a village in India called Tenda Bihar that we um, have sponsored for a while now. <clears throat> and the children there are uh, in so many ways so grateful for the love and the prayer and the financial support and all the things that we as the Sun Hills got, get to uh, partner with them to do and support them. And so in their way of being thankful, you may or may not know these children, you may or may not know this ministry, but um, this is here a little ornament for you to be able to read and take home and see uh, these children. These are real children, real faces that are really being impacted by the ministry over there. <clears throat> and this is their way just to say thank you to us as a church uh, that we can see that. And so there's a, a little passage on the back and these things. So let that be uh, something that warms your heart and uh, you can hang on your tree and continue to pray for them as we, as we go through this season. All right. We're getting settled now. I like it. We have a fun uh, time for us together here, and we're going to be interactive in some ways. We're going to be standing and sitting, singing and responding, responding in our own spirit and responding out loud. And so I want to encourage you, wherever you're at as you come in tonight, um, whatever you've got on your mind as you've brought into this place, um, take a deep breath with me. I have some good friends here on staff, and they... Patted me on the back as I came in today and said, Eric, take a deep breath. It's okay. Just, ah. And it's so good because I get excited about this. And I think we have some good things in front of us. And I want us to respond out of what the joy is in our own heart. Advent is a time of anticipation and preparation. We've been doing that all month long. We've been talking about it, but even in your own homes. There's been anticipation of what tomorrow morning will look like from kids and from grandparents and parents and everyone in between. There's been preparation for all these things and the baking and the decorating and the wrapping and all that great stuff. Um, but really what it comes to and is, is most um, specific towards is this arrival of Jesus that we all anticipate, the coming arrival of the Messiah. And we align our hearts with him in this waiting. And the Advent season isn't just December. We live in an Advent season, as we wait for the return and the anticipation of Emmanuel, of God with us, of our Messiah, coming and being with us again. And so, as we wait, we wait with hope and peace and love and joy and faith. And those are the words that we're going to look at and we're going to in engage together tonight as we sing songs and talk about those words. We're going to we're going to wait <clears throat> with hope and peace and love and joy and faith as we set the stage of our hearts for tomorrow morning's celebration in each of our own homes. So tonight and for the next 40, 50, 60 minutes together, we want to close the distance between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of earth, experience these thin places as they come near for us to be able to experience the kingdom of God and respond to it as it comes near to you. So I'll read this passage and we're going to sing together. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and he said to him, follow me. 
Now, Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael, and he said to him, We have found the one whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael turned to him and said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. So I want to invite us. Come and see what this is that Jesus has for us here in this place this evening. Here we go. Angels from the realms of glory wing your flight o'er the earth. He who sang creation's story now proclaim Messiah's birth. the newborn king shepherds in the fields abiding watching o'er your flocks by night God with And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose rivers do not fail. The promises of scripture are grand to eliminate injustice, to right every wrong, to wipe away every tear, to destroy every kind of evil. 
as scripture says, to restore to us the years that the locust has eaten. In fact, in the greatest expression of what the promises of Jesus are is to one day destroy even death itself. But this waiting, this waiting can take a toll on our spirit. As we wait for the hope that's promised, it can take a toll on us. In fact, we see that in Proverbs as it says, a hope deferred makes the heart sick. And so it leaves us in a state of disappointment. And disappointment seems to be the great enemy of hope. It doesn't just take away hope, but it takes away our ability to hope. But what if disappointment wasn't a barrier to hope, but instead it was a signal to our body and from our body that we've put our hope in the wrong thing or the wrong person? What if it was a signal to recalibrate our heart in that moment as we experience disappointment? What if it reveals our unhealthy attachments and in places that we've put our hope on and instead we shift our attachments, we shift our hope and place them onto the one who doesn't disappoint? Notice the source of the hope in the passage we just read. It's from within. We may be waiting for green pastures and still waters, and our good shepherd does promise to lead us to those places, but that's not the imagery in this passage. In this passage, it's in the midst of dry areas, of deserted lands, of desert landscapes that hope arises from within. The satisfaction uh, is from within. The strengthening of our bones is from within, even though the environment around us doesn't change. The well-watered garden and the satisfaction in the desert is what hope promises us. And so, these unfailing refreshments, we can find them in the songs that we're singing. We find them in the promises of Jesus. This is the hope that Jesus has offered to us in himself. This is the presence of the Spirit in you. We're not going to conjure up this hope in and of our own strength. We have this hope because it dwells up within us, strengthening our bones and making us a well-watered garden. We are a people who wait, but we do not wait in vain. We wait with hope. So as we begin this next song, I want to give a moment for us again in that spaces of taking a breath, and listening to what God has to say, here's what I'll ask. Draw your attention to the things that you're hoping for. So you can close your eyes right there where you are. Draw your attention to the things that you're hoping for. Ask the Father what his posture or his attitude is towards those things. God, what do you feel towards the things that we're hoping for? And as the Spirit is in you, you can ask Him, is there anything you want to say to me about those things? Our hope is in you, Jesus. What do you want to say to us about the things and the attachments in our own life as we hope for your promises?
on that one. We went hard. (laughs) Love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his son, his one and only son, into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. God's base emotion towards us is love. Just, I'm going to say that again. God's base emotion towards us is love. When God looks at you and he looks at me, he brims over with love and delight and affection for us because God is love. That's the emotion he has towards us. That's the feeling he has towards us when he sees us. And love plays a central role in this Christmas story. It's Joseph's Joseph's protective love for Mary as she um, tells him the news of what's going to be happening and how that's going to change and shift their relationship and the direction of their marriage. It's Mary's love for her newborn son as she's told who this child is in her and the journey they go on. And it's the Father's love towards us in sending Jesus to be an example of his love. And it's a sacrifice that is the very bridge that connects us to the Trinitarian God, to the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit That's what brings us into his loving presence. We get to live in that love. We get to receive that love and let it wash over us and transform us. And then we get to give that love away. That's our goal. That's our journey. Continually growing in, receiving, and giving away God's love. 
So I want to read the passage in its entirety. That was an excerpt from a larger section. And I want these words to wash over us and allow it to refresh your spirit. So again, I'm going to read this all the way through, and then I'll prompt us in, as we pray out of this space. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to the full expression in us. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and that he lives in us. And furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. And all who declare that Jesus is the Son of God has God living in them. And they live in God. We know how much God loves us. And we have put our trust in his love. God is love. So here's my prompt for us, my invitation. Where did you experience God's love this week? Just reflect on it for a moment. And where do you need to experience God's love in this coming week? God, you are love. And as we declare your son, as we declare his sacrifice and your love for us, you are in us and we are in you. And so, God, we want to experience the fullness of your love. God, we need you. But it's not just us. Who else needs to experience God's love through you? Before we, we sing this next song, take a moment for whoever those people are or that person that comes to mind. Who else needs to experience God's love through you? I want you to pray for them now. Pray that they experience God's love. They experience God's love over them and they experience God's love in them. It's such a powerful force. And we have the ability then to pray.
Amen. Speaking of Jesus and the time that Mary and Joseph brought him to the temple, Simon, the priest, took Jesus in his arms and he praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. Speaking about himself. For my eyes have seen your salvation. And gazing upon Jesus there at the temple, he says, My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory of your people, Israel. And the child's father and mother marveled at what was being said about him. Joy. Joy is not something that we manufacture in ourselves, that we work up in us with an with a upbeat song or good intentions. Joy is not something that we can make happen. Joy is a byproduct of salvation. That's what was happening there in this temple as Simon was looking at him and saying, this is salvation. I've seen it come. And his joy overcame him. He says, I can be done. I can be done now in my life at this point. You can dismiss me from service because I have seen the salvation of the Lord. And so salvation brings joy because salvation is Jesus, is the living God stepping in and changing our reality, stepping into our life and changing our reality, breathing life into things that we thought we're dead. There is absolutely a spiritual and a natural component to salvation in us, which is what causes joy to arise in us. We need to be saved from sin. Yes, absolutely. And we also need to be saved from the physical things, from uh, relationships, from um, sickness, from abuse, from relational conflict, from unemployment, from whatever it is you're experiencing. Salvation comes in and changes our reality. In the language of Paul, we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. There is this three nature component to God's salvation. It's rooted in the past in the works of Jesus and our confession of our faith in him. It's now being worked out in the present as we receive him and actively allow him to change our current life and circumstances. And then it's guaranteed for the future for us and we can live in the joy of the hope of what salvation is for us now and forever. Joy is rooted in God and living in the way that God has called us to live in the long exposure to the way of Jesus, as we've been talking about here on our Sunday mornings. The way of Jesus, when followed over time, leads to maximum joy in our life. God is calling us and showing us the best way to be human. And our joy overflows into gratitude and into worship. It's kind of this cycle. As we reflect on his salvation in our life, joy wells up in us. We then project it in gratefulness and in worship. And then the act of worship actually leads to more joy in us. So we sing songs. So we tell people of the joy that's in our life. We respond with laughing. We respond with dancing. We respond with a cheer, a hooray, a clap of hands. Whatever it is, as you respond to the joy in you, it leads to more joy in your life. And so that's our response to this word and this practice for us now. As we sing this next song, we will respond in joy and in praise just like we saw in this passage as he responds to the salvation that he sees in Christ, we respond to that in our own sense. As you sense his nearness, you can remember his goodness and reflect on his promises in us. So let's respond in joy, whatever that looks like for you, if that's sitting, if that's standing, raising hands, clapping, jumping, laughing, whatever that is for you, let yourself, let your spirit respond in joy in this piece and as we continue on in this whole thing this evening.
government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign, of, he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. say if one of these words are the ones that I've been struggling with most this season, this is the one. Peace. Finding peace in the midst of life. It, it's kind of this, I'll have peace once it's done, once something is over, right? We'll have peace once the shopping is done. We'll have peace once everything is wrapped and put under the tree. We'll have peace when this year is finally wrapped up and the new year begins We'll have peace when Christmas Day finally comes. Peace always seems to be just a little bit further away, just around the next corner. Then, then I'll have peace. The peace of God comes through the rule of the kingdom of God. That's who the Prince of Peace is. The one who rules a kingdom filled and governed with peace that doesn't have an end that continues to grow and grow and grow into greater and greater peace for us. So what if peace comes not by getting everything done? I'm preaching to myself as I speak these words. What if it's not by getting everything done, but instead by receiving the invitation as members of the kingdom of God to rest? That's his invitation to us, to rest because peace is not about the absence of something in your life. Once this is gone, then peace can enter in. But it's about the presence of someone in our life. And here's how I come to that conclusion. Uh, we see throughout Scripture God not backing away and shying away from the chaos, but instead entering into the chaos with his people. If we read in Genesis, you see there is chaotic nothingness all around the earth, and the Spirit of the Lord hovers over over that and then enters into it. He doesn't move away from chaos. People's lives that we see and we can track through scripture, we watch how God enters into chaos with them and then brings order to it. He's restoring order wherever chaos abounds. And so we wait for the return of Jesus and the Prince of Peace. And when he returns in full, he will put all things right but tonight we invite in the Prince of Peace into the chaos in our life. So what are we telling ourselves still needs to happen before we can have peace? What do we still need to have to get done before peace can really take root in our life? Here's the practice and the invitation. Give him access to the chaos in your spirit. Give him access to the chaos in your family. Give him access to the chaos in your Christmas. It might sound like this, and you can pray these words, or you can pray them differently. Jesus, I give you everyone and everything so that I can have your peace. God, you have access to our heart. 
You have access to the chaos in our life. And not that that you just have it, we grant it to you. But we invite you in, the Prince of Peace, to bring, bring peace in our life. We give these things to you, Father. get into it or like not do it. Okay, ready? Let's clap it. Here we go. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We can commit to clapping. All right. Our final word as we wrap up tonight is faith. God created everything through Jesus. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. We're going to light some candles here as representations of this light here in us and among us that is in Christ around us and uh, through us here. So while you're lighting candles, there'll be some ruckus and commotion, and that's okay. It's part of the fun. If we need to have the lights up a little bit to make it happen, that's good too. But it's amazing what the smallest amount of light can do to change our mood and warm our spirit. I can remember 
cold mornings while backpacking or camping, uh, getting up early in the tent, uh, your sleeping bag is pulled up over your face and you just don't want to get out of the tent that day. And you do, you force yourself up and put on your warm clothes and you stand over the hot stove trying just to get a warm breakfast in your belly. And as it's beginning to warm your belly, you're shivering there wondering, why did I come out here to do this? And then at that moment, the sun peaks over the hill just a bit, not a lot of sun, and it hits your face, and that feeling of, ah, warmth, just a little bit of light, just a little bit of sunshine on your face changes your mood, it changes your spirit, it changes your warmth of your whole body. It's amazing what a small amount of light can do. Our faith is not wishful thinking. Our faith is not blind hope. It's not feel-good fairy tales. Our faith is rooted and grounded in a person because we have all experienced in Christ his love and his joy and his peace and his hope. We have experience of a little bit of light in cold and dark places in our soul. We have experienced the light of Jesus that warms our spirit. And we have faith then for what comes next based on what we've already experienced in Christ. This isn't just for us. All that we bring, all that the kingdom of heaven brings near to us, others get to experience this light as well. That's our calling, to experience this ourselves, the light that we hold, and then for the rest of the world to experience the light that you bring as a follower of Jesus. And so this is why we've decided to have a a end-of-the-year special offering. We've been talking about it all month. This is a way for us, for our light to shine beyond this building. We have a local partner ministry that we want to help this women and children's home build um, a little prayer room for the women to be able to just get away from the craziness of uh, of the whole house and have a time just to be with her and with God and get some rest and peace and quiet. And so we've designated some of the funds that we're raising for that. And then there's a partner that we have in Mexico I talked about a couple of weeks ago that uh, has a a rehab center for men and women, and we want to sponsor four women, four women to go through a six-month program uh, to be able to be restored not just from uh, their own addictions, but back to their own family and then back into the community. And the partner that we have down there is just an amazing man and woman who's doing that. And so everything we raise for this full $5,900, everything that we raise is going to go outside of this building towards one of those two ministries. And we want to in- invite you to join us in it. So if you haven't got it, gotten to yet, you can do that here tonight. You can, uh, if you want to drop money in or write on a check that just says special offering, you can also do it online as well and be able to participate in that. I want our light here in this church to be able to shine far beyond these walls, far beyond these seats. Our faith leads us back to hope and joy and peace and love that we have in Emmanuel. So tonight, Let's end and stand and sing a joyful response to the Lord with this final Christmas song for us.
joy go from this building into the rest of this world. And by way of reminder, thank you everyone who is uh, helping to serve tomorrow morning, our homeless up in Placerville. I uh, appreciate that all of you are going to be there and loving on them with the love of Jesus and your light shining brightly there. Also, our next gathering is going to be January 2nd. We won't be here the day after Christmas, but we will be back to celebrate and bring in the new year, starting with rest in this place. So we want to invite everyone to be back here again January 2nd. We love you all. Have a wonderful Merry Christmas. Thank you, Chloe.